Hello, everyone. It's Roslyn again, and, and it's time for Real Talk Now. Today, we have a special episode, an episode that involves us focusing on our health, an episode that in which we will discuss some things and, and, and some things that we can put in place to incorporate into our lives to assist in developing or continuing on your journey of being proactive about cancer and proactive about our health as a whole. Now, a cancer diagnosis impacts in so many ways. It impacts us spiritually, psychologically, physically, and financially. When the word cancer is heard, or any illness by that matter, many have been conditioned to hear the word death. Often this is because of the uncertainty of how to treat the illness and, and, the, and the fact that we are unaware of things that can be done to possibly be proactive before we received, receive a diagnosis. Today, we will hear from two women that will walk us through ways to proactively approach life and not death, but life. We will learn of tools and regimens that, that can assist along the journey. Our guests today are Kelly Raheem Brooks and Sydney Tucker Bonds. Our, our nutritional guru, Rosalind Anderson, was also scheduled to be a guest, but she had to be called to another duty today. But don't you worry, don't you worry because we will schedule another episode with her in the future because her journey and her platform is so very powerful and we don't want you to miss it. Now family, we do not claim to have the cure for any disease. That's not, a, that's not our claim today. And, and we, do, we also do not claim to be medical doctors. And we are in no way attempting to override any medical team of professionals. What we are attempting to do, we are attempting to inform of things that can be incorporated into our lives or in, in order for us to continue on our lives in an effort to be proactive, be proactive about our health. That's the goal today. What I want to do is ask you all to listen. I want you to take notes, ask questions and learn. Now, Miss Sydney, I want you to come on uh, with me right now and I want you to unmute yourself. And I want you to introduce yourself and, and introduce and educate us on the Live to Leave Your Legacy program. Okay, can you see me? Okay, so I need to start sharing my screen, correct? That's correct. So, good morning to some of you and good afternoon to others, it depends on where you are in the states as to the time in my state is still morning. Who am I? Sydney Barnes is a mother, a grandmother, a daughter of the King, a servant for Christ. I come from three generations of strong black women um, who believe in pre-planning. Pre my father's mother who was a nurse and you see her in her beautiful hat that you don't see nurses wear anymore, my mother and myself. I created um, Live to Lead Your Legacy based on the needs to help other people to take the emotional and financial burdens off their loved ones in the event they became incapacitated and can't speak on their own behalf, diagnosed with a serious or even death may occur. When you think about legacy and leaving a legacy, a lot of people think of inheritance, money, um, it could be property, dining, dying. When I think of legacy also, I think about family, 
and pre-planning, making it easier on our family. So what I'm gonna talk to you about today is getting your um, affairs in order. And getting your affairs in order consists of while you're leaving to take the stress off your loved one. It, like I said before, in the case of an um, injury or accident and you're not able to speak on your own behalf. We're going to talk today about an advanced care directive, you choosing um, your healthcare agent, the person who is going to speak on your behalf if that person isn't available. We want to know about your choices, your wishes, what you would want in these events so people don't have to guess about it. We're going to talk a little bit about a living will. Now, a living will is valid before death what life support treatment means to you, what the do not resuscitate means, what is the pulse? We also gonna cover a little bit about a general durable power of attorney and the needs of why you should have one. What falls under a general power of attorney? The last thing we'll probably cover, well, not the last, is a will and last testament. Now that takes effect after you die, you have to have someone be responsible for your affairs. After you die, you have to sign an um, executive, executor, excuse me, um, a will. Does it go through probate or not? Um, seasons of life. I want you to think about the seasons of life you're in. Each day when we were born, we started dying. Ecclesiastic 3 and 2 tells us, there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. We, none of us can escape that. Now, I don't know what part of your life you're in. I'm actually a harvest time in the 55 to 69 group. But springtime is when you're 18 to 39. Summertime is 40 to 54. Again, harvest time is 55 to 69. And if you're in your winter time, we're talking about 70 and over. The Bible tells us you are blessed to live past 70. Anything three scores and 10 in the Bible is like 70 years over. You um, borrow time. In any of these groups, time is constantly running out. Nobody wants to talk about dying, or even an accident injury happening. We just don't like talking about this kind of stuff. So uh, advanced healthcare directory, who directive, who needs one? Anyone over the age of 18 should have a healthcare director. What it does is allows you to participate and direct your own healthcare decisions. While you're in your right mind, while you're thinking rationally, you could put down on paper, it's a legal document of how you wanna be treated if you're in that situation. It becomes effective in the event you were able to speak on your behalf. What it does, it takes the burdens off your loved ones during a tragedy or loss so they can focus on what's important. A living will, it allows you to direct your medical treatment um, if you become incapacitated. What you want for life support? What if you become um, brain dead? What if you um, are in a coma? How do you want your life to go? Your family is all confused. They're hurting emotionally. Okay, they really don't know what you want, what your choices are. Do you want to be put on medical devices to help you breathe? Do you want to be given CPR, blood transfusion, dialysis? In the event you were to pass, do you want to donate your organs? A do not resuscitate order. It is written by a medical doctor. It only applies when a patient does not have a pulse, not breathing, is unresponsive. You might say, why wouldn't I want to be um, resuscitated? I'll, I'll give you an example of my own life. My mother was clear she wanted to live regardless of what happened to her. I'll never forget being in the um, ER room and my mother was in stage four cancer. Her heart stopped. They worked until they got her back. She survived. My father was very clear. He did not ever want to be um, resuscitated. So if you do not want to be resuscitated, 
that has to be that has to be an order. Otherwise, the medical teams will automatically resuscitate you if you don't have a doctor's written order. Um, I had I know this one case where um, a sister, her brother was in the hospital and she saw the little red sign on his his bracelet fell on the floor and she picked it up and said, what does this mean? They're like, we can't, um, if his heart stops, we can't um, resuscitate him. She ran out to the nurse's station and said, oh, no, 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 this is a mistake. They're like, ma'am, you cannot override this. This is his order. So again, it was his life and his choice. His sister could not change that. So some of you may not have ever heard about a pulse, what it is, it's, it's a physician order for life-sustaining treatment. A pulse can be written by a physician, uh, nurses, um, the ARMP, a physician assistant, and that helps people who have a serious illness. Like if you have cancer, emphysema, you know, you have less than 12 months to live. Um, it gives you control over what you want and only a doctor can um, write that order. Um, it replaces the out of hospital, the D, um, do not resuscitate. Okay, so let's compare advanced healthcare directive and a pulse. All adults need an advanced healthcare directive. I'm sorry, Sydney, I'm so sorry. Okay. Is it possible to make um, put it in a different view, the slideshow view, just so we can see it a little clearer? I'll go uh, up, to, go yeah, up I, top. Mm -hmm. I know how I, this bar is um, in my way. Told you your challenge, Mimi. Uh, let me see how I can figure out how. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute to be able to um, hook onto this, okay? Okay. Now it says this in the slideshow mode. Can you see it better now? Oh, you got to share the screen again. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. Trial and error. How we do. If we have to stop, then that's okay. We're here to that's educate. Now, start it from the beginning. When you push slide so, and then uh -huh. start from the beginning. Oh, from where you are right now, the current slide. You should be able to see it. I can see it right now. It's on the slide. Yeah, we can see it, but we can't see it that it's bigger. That's why I was trying to get it big. That's okay. Go ahead and do what you do. Mm, that's weird because it did stop on. Hold on, let me see a little bit more. There we go. Start from the current slide. Now, can you see it? You got it. That's it. Okay, this is going to be interesting how I get to the next slide, but we'll work it out. So uh, advanced healthcare directive is for all adults, anyone over the age of 18 or over. A pulse is only for someone who has a serious illness. Advanced, hair, advanced directive is for future care. You know, you're just putting this in place in the event something happened happens. A pulse is if you're in the current state in future care, you already know you have a serious illness. Advanced directive is um, pa the patient is in control. You're writing it out. You're telling your loved ones what you want. Whereas with the pulse, a physician has to sign that order or um, a physician assistant or an AMP. Um, only you can complete the form um, for advanced care directive. Um, the pulse authorized discussions option if patient lacks um, capacity. Um, the patient um, gives the order in the advanced health care directive, and it is up to the family to honor the patient's um, wishes and their choices. And the pulse is the provider is responsible for it.
and they determine if it needs to be in place. Nobody else does that. Okay, what is a medical um, durable power of attorney? It gives guidance to your provider of what you want. It's prepared for you, like I said, in advance, and you should make sure all your agents, whoever you choose to um, administer your directive, they have a copy and your doctor has a copy. It provides clarity and closure to your loved ones. It prevents family conflict amongst different members. Everyone in your family has an opinion of what they should um, what should be done with your life. And I want to pause here for a minute because if you don't have an uh, advanced care directive, someone you actually don't want to make decisions about your life can be making the decision. Every state has a law how it falls in. Now, if you're married, your spouse is automatically put in control if you don't have an advanced care directive. If you're not married, your children are the next in order. If you don't have children, your parents, if they're alive, if your parents aren't alive, then it goes to your next sibling, the oldest one. Let's say you and your sister or brother don't get along. Do you know that person is going to be in control and making decisions of what happens to you on your behalf if you can't talk to yourself for yourself? So keep that in mind. That's one good reason it's important to have this. Um, it limits the emotional burnings of your those closest to you. How many families get into a hospital if somebody's in a serious accident or something and they're bickering of what should be done and the doctor is confused? So it, it, it's a messed up situation. So that's why you should have a medical durable power of attorney and a healthcare directive. Um, a financial um, power of attorney is a legal document that allows you to appoint someone to manage your finances and property. You're all laid up in the hospital. You can't speak on your behalf. The bills don't stop coming. The mortgage doesn't stop coming. You have to have a financial, <clears throat> excuse me, durable and power of attorney in place for someone to be able to go into your bank account to make sure to get money so they could pay your bills, so they could speak on behalf if they needed to on your retirement accounts, your government or taxes. Now, remember, this is only valid. They have to have a piece of paper to show these institutions that they have that authority, and that's because you trusted them and gave them that. When we talk about a, a last will, a last will and testament is a legal document detailing your wishes regarding your assets and um, support for your dependents after death. You might not think you need a will. A lot of people are, I don't have anything, but you do have something. Your life is valuable, your legacy. If it's just books, you have something and you have a right to say who gets your books, where you want them distributed. The last will is um, it's after death because you have the living will, which is before death. The last, um, the regular will, the last will is after death. It informs your assets distribute, distribution. It nominates an executor who's gonna um, be in charge of your will. It nominates if there are children involved, how you want your children to be cared for, who you want to have your children. It deals with will, real property. Does your will go to probate? Does it, is it non-probatable? -prob now, let me share this with you. If you have a house or anything, or 401ks, anything over $100,000, it needs to go to probate. What's probate? You, you got to go downtown to the courthouse and get um, to fill out for a probate. A judge has to actually sign it and name the executor. If you don't have um, property or assets over $100,000, and a lot of people think they don't have things over $100,000, but let me tell you this. If you got 401ks, you might have over $100,000. So learn more about that. A testament is real property and personal property. Okay, what I want to talk to you about, what I do um, is advanced healthcare directory. It's called Five Wishes. It includes um, the advanced healthcare directory. It has a living will and a funeral declarations. 
There are a lot of advanced healthcare directives one can complete. You can go to your lawyer and get a basic one, but it doesn't detail your wishes and how you want things to be done with your care. Um, so the five wishes offers a lot of um, things, a regular one in one document. The five wishes allows you to choose three healthcare agents to act on your behalf. So a lot of people say, oh, my daughter's going to be in control of my life. I want her to make your deci decisions. What if you and your daughter are actually on a trip together and something happens to both of you? Well, who's going to make decisions? So in the five wishes, we do three health care. If you can't get the first one, you have a second one and a third one. You put them in the order of how you want. The five wishes, um, you go through the person you want to make decisions for you when you can't. It helps outline um, the kind of medical treatment you want, like I was telling you before. How do you want to live? Do you want to, how long would you want to stay in a coma? Three days, two days? How much do you want to be on life support? Some people have been on life support for, um, in a coma, I should say, for one or two years. Is that how you want your life to be? What if you become brain dead? Do you want to be a vegetable and live? Um, that's your decision, nobody else's. Now your loved ones can be emotional and they like, no, I don't want nothing to happen. They don't think about the financial burden it's gonna cost. They don't think about the emotional stress. So what you're doing is you're outlining all this before it happens. You know what you want. How comfortable do you wanna be? Well, listen to this. I'm a spa girl, I love massages. I'm putting down in writing, I want you to massage me. Let's say I'm laying up and have cancer or something and I'm in pain. Please bring somebody in to massage me. Give you an example of what I did up for five wishes on someone. Her mother was sick. And once I did her five wishes, she um, thought about what I had asked about the rubbing oil and massaging. So she went home and she did it on her mother. Her mother looked at her and she said, where did you learn this from? And she says, well, my boss, I completed my five wishes with her. And that was one of the questions. Her mother looked at her and said, you know what? I hope your children do this for you. So it, it just brought peace to that person. And when her mother passed, she was so happy about the things that she did from, for her mother that she learned just by completing her five wishes. How do you want people to treat you? Do you want people by your bedside talking to you, rubbing your hand, reading you poems, reading scriptures? Do you want people at all? Now, when I have completed the five wishes with various people, I hear so many different responses. I had, my uncle said, I don't want anybody around me. Some people might want pictures around them. That brings them comfort. Again, this is your life and your choice. You make it, you put it down in writing for someone to follow. What you want your loved ones to know. This is really important because I'm going to be real about you. Some families have a lot of issues. Some people say they love each other, but yet they won't speak to one another. For me, love is an action word by what you do. What if you got mad with somebody? What would you want them to know if you died? You could leave in the um, five wishes. I want my family to know I love them. I forgive them for whatever we've done. We don't think about stuff like that, but it is important. Okay. I want that to that. Okay, another thing that um, I offer is the travel protection um, assurance plan. Traveling is not second nature to all, of, to most of us, I'll say. Um, cruises, traveling, let's say you were 75 miles away from your home and pass. This, this plan is for if you're 75 miles away from your home and pass. Let's say you're on the beach of Aruba. The unfortunate ha happened, you had a heart attack. This plan allows you, um, your family to um, dial one number and we would send somebody in Aruba to pick up your body and we would process it to bring it back home. All this is covered in this 
one plan for one price at the time it's 495 it's a life insurance plan not a like a travel insurance plan it's not like the travel insurance plan you buy when you buy a plane ticket because all they do is um, they help arrange things they don't pay for a funeral home to pick you up and if you know anything about funeral homes just for them to come out and pick a body up it's like to two thousand to five thousand dollars when you talk about an airplane ticket to transport a body back home you're talking about thousands of dollars so this policy um, plan covers that um, every if you love to travel it's a great policy to have um, I actually purchased mine me and my husband back in 1999 and um I had to think about losing it in 2004, four, my husband was diagnosed with cancer, very sick. And then his mother was diagnosed along with my mother. His mother was sick and we knew she wouldn't have that much time. I asked my husband, do you wanna go? And he did. What, I, what gave me um, relief was knowing if I took him down to Mississippi and he passed, would have been okay. I could have got him back home without having to pay a lot of money. So that plan brought me comfort. Same thing with my father. I took him back home to his home state in 2014. He had dementia and a lot of other illnesses. I purchased him a plan for the same reason. If he passed in Memphis, I would have been able to bring him back home wouldn't have to worry about setting up any GoFundMe accounts, asking anybody to help out with that. And let's go back when we talk about leaving your legacy. You don't wanna leave a legacy where your family has to think about how to pay for things that you should have paid for. Beginning, we all need to take responsible for our own life, even in the event of dying. We plan for weddings, graduations, and everything else. Be responsible. And, um, plan for when for your final resting. Um, okay, Sydney Barnes lived every day to leave her legacy. When I wake up, I'm very grateful for life. I get up, I walk in my legacy. I give to people and it's important to do that. It's important to build relationships with others. Walk in your purpose. You're responsible for your own life. Leave. I, I'm leaving instructions for my loved ones of how I want to be um, cared for. I think it's important for them to honor my wishes. I have a certain way I like to do things. My kids, my family and friends can tell you about me, but they can't speak for me like I can speak for me. So I want to make sure it's, it's wrote down. I have everything in a box, just as I'm recommending you to do, put your fares in order so your loved ones know they're already hurting, you know, when they find out something happens to you. Make it easier for them. Leaving a legacy, what does that mean? Passing on your family values. For me, it's being a servant, giving. The Proverbs 13 and 22 tells us, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children and their children. So remember, an inheritance doesn't have to be just money. It could be property. It could mean a lot of things. Your legacy means a lot of things. What does your life mean to you? What do you want others to remember you by? Every life is so important. Your life, your choice, your wishes. Why not be intentional? intentional about yours. Hopefully I have said something to you today to get your attention to think um, more about putting your information in writing. If you want more information from me, please feel free to contact me at 206-455-5318. You can also go to my website, www.sydneytconsulting.com. Be responsible for your life. Thank you. Great job, great job. Okay, uh, we had a few questions and I think that you answered some, but I'm gonna still be obedient and ask these questions, okay? How can someone ask, they wanted to know 
more detail about the advanced directive because they want to know how to go about getting a, being able to fill it out, get a copy, <clears throat> and can it be sent to them? Or do you prefer that they get in touch with you? Because I'm sure there's a lot of details involved. It's not just about filling it out. There's some details that you may can guide them on. So uh, can you answer that for us? Okay, so what I do is I have people follow up with me, and um, I'm going to give you an example of my sister. She's in stage four cancer, and she was taking it for granted. Oh, you you know how to do everything, but when we start going through it, she was like, uh, "I never thought about that. Let me think about that for a minute." So. Things you think you might know, and that's why I said it's so important for you to put your stuff in writing. We go over that. I, it could take about 30 minutes. It could take an hour because I asked some provoking questions. And the five wishes, like I said, you name your um, three healthcare agents. We talk about what you want to do, how comfortable you want to be. It's not just one question. It's a couple of things. So it helps you reflect on things, uh, you know, and that's what I'm here for. So you can call me. We can talk about it. I can fill it out. Um, I could fill it out just talking to you on the phone and then send it over to you. And then you would have to get it notarized. Does awesome. that answer your question? I think so. But if it doesn't. Astrid, uh, one of my babies, she asked that question. If not, she's going to, I can talk to her more about it and put her in touch with you, even if she didn't get the, the information on how to get in touch with you, okay? Astrid um, and Xander? Yes. You know Astrid. Astrid everywhere. That's one of my babies. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, okay. The major difference between the advanced directive and the, um, you know, I can't ever remember the pulse, name of the pulse. Pulse, yes. T go there again. And I say that because, you know, that was one of those ones that really got me when you were explaining it. Because, like you said, many people have never heard of that pulse. But I want you to make sure that they get the difference. Who can fill it out? When is it needed? What it, cut, you know, all of that. If you can quickly, and, or I can't say quickly, if you can kind of hit on that again. Okay, I was going to go back and share my screen and bring that up for you guys. Okay, advanced care directive, like I said, is something you prepare um, at the age of 18. It comes um, active if you were incapacitated or you're sick and in the hospital. Advanced care directive, um, a pulse is if you have a serious illness and it's usually like you've been diagnosed with 12 or less months to live, okay? And there's no hope for things getting better. You got cancer, you might have diabetes really serious, you might be on kidney dia dialysis, you and your doctor and your family members are talking about that. And there's really no hope, you know, of you living. So the doctor fills out and I've seen it. It's usually in a green form because there was one on my father. Um, and it has to be completed by a physician. OK, you have in the doctor's office having a discussion with them and it's in your chart. Um, it's authorized to discuss option if patients have la lack of capacity. So basically you're at end of the life in palliative care or something like that, but that serious or chronic illness has to be in place for the, a doctor to ever write an order like that. And think about it, uh, you talked about the advanced care directive. I usually compare it to the DNR too. Because Rosalind, I think you asked me that um, what's the difference between them? A DNR, it has to do with CPR. There is hope. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Because like I said, that one right there can really stump. But, you know, I, and I just recommend, again, that you all get in touch with her because she's doing a great job on this PowerPoint of her presentation. But she can walk you through so many other things because you may have questions that she, as you're talking, that may arise as she continues to 
you know, describe the program to it to you because there's so many aspects of it. And that leads me to my, my next question is that any aspect of the plan, because like you said, there's several arms here in this plan. Can any aspect of the plan be gifted to someone? Not just in death, but or or, or life, period. Can you gift this or give me your thoughts on that? Rosalind, I'm glad you said that because it is a great gift to give someone. I had one lady, uh, she wanted to gift it to her parents because in the Black culture, our parents don't like to talk about death. And kids are uncomfortable talking to their parents because in our culture, it's like in the older culture, the baby boomers, you do as I say, not, you know, you do what I said, you don't question me. And um, even with, um, <laughs> I have friends who their spouse might have wanted to talk to them and they don't, people shut down when you talk about death. So it's easier for me to come in there and have that conversation with them and you know, the child will pay for it or the parent will pay for it. So you can gift it. And let me tell you something, that's the best gift you could give somebody. You know, we buy people all kinds of gifts. We have material things that don't mean anything, but this is very important. Yes, very important. Okay, any final thing you want to say? Uh, if not, we're going to continue on. Again, great job. Uh, this is such an awesome program, like I said. And, you know, what surprised me most one is about that travel thing. And many of us, I'm telling you, many of us travel. I'm definitely going to get that one because I you just never know. Have you heard of those horror stories? Someone yeah. tried on a cruise or you know something like that and they're like okay how are we gonna get you know so well, let me tell you something for people who like to travel um this is the one i like to use um i know somebody who went to the philippines and they pass you know how much money it costs to bring a body back from the philippines like sixteen thousand dollars the family didn't know how they were going to get the body back. I don't need to know if they did. But one thing with the travel plan is your family calls this number and they tell the person on the other line what's going on. At that point, the company takes over. They will coordinate with the funeral home where you want the body taken to. Now, everybody doesn't want to be buried, okay? We have a lot of cremation going on and I'm one of them. My policy and everything is already paid for. So let's say I'm over in Aruba and I pass. My kids have to dial that number. They um, coordinate with that funeral home. The funeral home goes and picks up the body. They bring it to their funeral home and then they cremate the body. And then they send the urns back. You don't not paying for no airplane ticket or anything like that. But if you were buried, the plan does cover all that. So whereas my, my pre-planning has been done in state, my kids would be reimbursed for that part of that plan because the travel plan took care of it. I have the travel plan and then I have a plan paid for at the funeral home. So it's, it's like, a you want to say you buy life insurance, car insurance to prevent things from happening. I mean, hopefully you will never need it, but for four ninety five dollars one time fee, it's the best investment you can make. It really is versus thousands your family would have to pay if something happened. 75 miles from home is not that far. And I'm going to tell you, funeral homes in your own home state charge by the mile to pick up bodies. And when you wait to the last minute to make your funeral um, arrangements, they play on your emotions. All of us have had loved ones die. Now, I don't know how many people have actually had to do planning for that. But when you go in there, what they do, they take you to the most expensive thing. And that could cost you a lot of money. Use your life insurance for um, 
for things for your family could do something for where they're not spending all the money on that. And sometimes funeral homes don't take all life insurance policy. And then family have to call one another and say, we need this amount of money. How many times have you went out on Facebook and saw GoFundMe accounts? Your, you should not put your family in that kind of situation. To me, it's embarrassing. I take care of business. I should take care of my life in the business and where my family could relax and not have to worry about that. You're in pain already. We can't relieve um, emotional stress and everything, but that financial stress, you can definitely help your family with that. Awesome. Yes, yes. Okay. Any final thoughts or because you said a lot, which is in a good way. <laughs> It's not that easy. I can talk to Cindy like that, y'all. <laughs> but uh, you did a great job as usual. Any, go ahead. Any final thoughts? Death is not an easy subject to talk about. Everybody can't talk about it. I am so blessed that um, God has given me the ability to talk to people. I served on the church committee funeral committee for years, and I have seen a lot of things. I've seen family stop talking based on stuff that ain't even their business. If I fill out my will and I want to give it to one or two people, that's my business. You get people who get mad, they stop speaking to their families and everything behind this stuff and you can help prevent it because it was your wishes, not those people around it. Now, let me tell you something. If you don't have a will, the court can be making decisions on your behalf. And the more the family bickers, it costs lawyer fees and they're using the money up that you had set aside for other people. So be wise about this. You can know people get your fares in order. Call me. All right. <laughs> That's right. Good job. So if anyone did not get all that information as far as how to contact her, just give me a call. Or, or what you in, in when well, I even give me a call, reach out to me. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it in the call. chat, Rosalyn. I'll put it in, in the chat. Also. Okay. 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 And um, uh, and those that's on uh Facebook, same thing. You know, if you, you can reach out <clears throat> to Sydney as well, she has a platform on Facebook where you can reach out to me. I can put you in contact with her because, like I said, this is this is very powerful, some very powerful stuff here. So okay, so what we're gonna do now, Miss Kelly. Are you ready? Thanks yeah. again. Steve. Yes, I am ready. All right. All right. So we, I'm going to get you to go ahead, do your thing and educate us because you have quite a powerful journey that you were on or you're still on. And tell us some of the things that you had to put in place to assist you and in, in order for you to, to create a healthy lifestyle, a healthy lifestyle for yourself. Oh. Um. Well, first thing that was the most one, one of the most important things was discipline. Um, is it okay for me to share my screen now? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and then I'll give a brief intro as well. All right, can you all see this? Okay, I'm just going to do like I did with Sydney. If you're going to put it in a slideshow view and start mm -hmm. it so it can be bigger so we can see it really well. Okay. Can you, can you see it okay? Yes, ma'am. That's beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful picture. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, just to give a little short intro about myself, um, from New Jersey, um, been in the body for quite some time and just... It's it's my walk with Christ is what has helped to really encourage me in terms of living a, a more spiritual and holistic life. Um, and so that's what I'm going to share with you guys on today. I have had a journey. Uh, and as Rosalind mentioned, I am still on a journey in terms of uh, maintaining that spiritual health and living holistically. It didn't start out very holistically, but it evolved into that. You know, as I grew more spiritually, as I got to understand some more things. And so that's what I wanted to um, share with you all on today. So um, if you want to take a few notes, if you want to reach out to me later with some questions, feel free, feel free to do so. Um, 
So I'll go ahead and jump in. Uh, Rosalind, can you repeat that question that you have for me? Oh, okay. Which say it again, ma'am? Can you repeat the question that you have for me? The the question. Mm -hmm. Oh, did I have a? <laughs> uh, when you first started, I was about to. <laughs> if not, I'll just jump in. Oh yeah. Uh, at, at the end, you go ahead and do your thing, and I'm going to save all questions for the end because you may cover whatever I was going to ask because I don't remember a question. <laughs> yeah. no. no worries. No worries. All right. So, um, starting off with this, Psalm 139, one of my favorite scriptures, the whole chapter actually, um, but I highlighted this one. I will give thanks to you because I am awesomely and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. Um, and I wanted to highlight this scripture just because God has created us so wonderfully, so awesomely, so masterfully. He created our bodies in such a way where they can take care of themselves. If we do what we are supposed to do to take care of them, um, they, can, they can withstand and overcome so many things, right? So I just wanted to highlight that scripture. Um, the next one I wanted to highlight is... Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 19 through 20. Um, and Paul is saying here, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought for a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And so in meditating on this, uh, our bodies are a a precious temple to God that we should treasure, that we should take care of, that he paid a, a hefty price for, you know, in particular for our souls. But aren't we to take care of our physical bodies as well um, that he's granted us to, to reside in for this time while we're here on earth? And so that's an encouragement for me to live better and to do better. Because I will tell you that I well, maybe still a bit. I'm a foodie, love to eat. I love food, um, and my body does not make does not mind gaining the weight and holding on to it. So it has been a journey in just trying to get it all, get the weight off, and keep it off. And so, for those of you who may not have, you know, kind of seen me in the past, I'm going to share just a, a before picture and kind of like where I am now in terms of uh, physically. Um, what I'm looking like. So this is me back in July 2013, as far as my weight loss journey. So I was a bit chunky. <laughs> and so that weight went up and down. I lose it, I gain it, I lose it, I gain it, I lose it, I gain it. It was stressful. It was, um, at times I was in tears because I didn't really like, you know, you know, you have that physical image of yourself. I didn't really like the way I looked um, in that space. And so, um, I'm sorry about that. And so, but it was hard because I love to eat, right? So I'll, I'll get the weight down. I go to the gym, I work out, you know, I'll, I'll get it off. And then I'll kind of go back into that space and I'll gain it again. And it, it was hard just to get to a space where um, I could be consistent. And so over the years, I've been journeying along, trying to get consistent. And so this is a recent, on the right, it's a recent picture of me um, uh, last month in September um, in Orlando. And so thankfully, I've been able to pretty much maintain you know, without going back to that, because I gave all of those clothes away when I was heavier. So I'm like, I'm not buying them again. So that's a that's another discipline, right? So what I wanted to share with you all um, about this journey and about living spiritually and holistically are some health and wellness tips. So one is the spiritual piece. That's number one. And just valuing your body, you know, the body that God has given us, valuing that body as uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is very precious, right? Um, knowing that he created us and that we're precious in his sight, you know, should give us some, some confidence and some encouragement 
um, when it comes to taking care of them. So we should be mindful of what we're putting into our bodies. And spiritually, you should be mindful of what we're letting into our psyches, right? Into our mental, into our emotional, you know, and, and filtering that through the word of God, through um, the lens of God, you know, having that view um, of how he would have us to be. And so it didn't always start out that way, but like I said, it's it's progressed into that, into that kind of thought process, um, which has helped me to create more of a spiritual discipline. And so with that, I want to jump in a little bit into fasting and the benefits of fasting. And so as we all, as we, we may be aware that there's a spiritual benefit, you know, you can grow closer to Christ, you can grow closer in your relationship with God, he can reveal some things to you. Um, the Bible mostly talks about fasting from food. Um, people nowadays will talk about, oh, you can fast from any number of things, things that may be just kind of distracted you from your spiritual walk. Um, so, but for the purpose of this, I'm going to talk about more specifically foods, right? So fasting from foods, um, determining what works best for you. You know, if you're going to do a 24-hour fast, if you're going to do a 12-hour fast, if you're going to do kind of the sun up, sun down fast, there's a variety of versions. You know, spiritually, you know, take that time when you're getting hungry and you will get hungry and, and pray to God, you know, meditate on his word. Um, think about some areas of your life that you like to grow in spiritually and mature in um, to help, you know, and God will give you the strength to get through it. Now, of course, you know, if you have some health issues in terms of some type of medications that you're taking, be very mindful, you know, of how you're, you know, if you were to partake in that, how that would affect you in your, um, in your health status. So be mindful of that as well. Now, of course, I'm not, you know, a medical or health professional, but I've been living and doing my own type of study and research type deal. Um, Rosalyn, you had your hand up? Yeah, yes, because um, we had a question I wanted to, before we get too far, someone wanted to, uh, you can probably, you may going to talk about this, but she wanted to know because she wants to lose weight mm -hmm. and she wants to know what are some, some ways in which she can go about doing that. Okay. Yes. And so one of the reasons why I included fasting is because in addition to the spiritual benefits, it also has physical benefits. Fasting can help you lose weight. It can help you to discipline your mind and your body in terms of your hunger levels, in terms of the amount of food that you're going to take in. And if you do it often enough and, and you kind of program yourself on it, you can get used to, you know, that hungry feeling you get when you're ready to eat. By fasting on a regular basis, you can you can get used to um, eating less, and you can get used to not being full all of the time. Like, don't eat to be full. You know, lower lower that calorie intake. Learn to be satisfied with smaller portions, and learn that it's okay to be a little hungry sometimes. Because we have this tendency to just want to eat when we get a little hungry, and if we're not careful. We didn't eat five, six times a day. We didn't snacked on this. We didn't snacked on that. We've um, we had breakfast, and then we turn around. We want to have a full lunch, and then we want to have a full dinner. We're having snacks in between, and over time, I've realized that uh, we don't have to eat three times a day. We don't have to have three full course meals a day. I know that's what we traditionally have been taught, but guess what? When you learn to incorporate fasting and the benefits of it, you, you'll you find out that you can go a lot longer without eating. You don't have to eat three squares a day. Now, if you can train yourself on that mindset and be okay with maybe eating just twice a day, you know, maybe eating once a day, you know, you'll find that you, and, and being mindful of what you're eating, you'll find that you'll be able to lose some weight because you're not taking in as many calories during the day. You know, and you're not just because the body takes about maybe 36 hours or so just to digest food, right? So we're eating around the clock, right? It's going to take longer for our bodies to digest all of that food. And what doesn't get all the way digested is going to get stored as body fat. 
And so it's going to be difficult to lose that weight, especially if you don't have a high metabolism, if you're if you're not working out on a regular basis um, and really burning off, you know, that those energy or if you have some other issues that are causing you to maintain weight, um, that's going to make it difficult to lose the weight. And so that's why I say it's, it's really a mental, <laughs> mental and a, a spiritual discipline as well um, to, to be strong enough to withstand it because you know you're going to go to functions we've been going to weddings every week we had a wedding right now starts at starts at four o'clock and we're probably going to end up staying a little bit and they're going to have a reception and they, guess what there'll be food passing around so if you're not trained and disciplined in that mind you'll just be eating whatever you want and then you know you're off that discipline rocker next thing you know you've taken in more calories than maybe you wanted to so you kind of got to do some calorie counting you know, if you really want to lose the weight. So first thing to do is make up your mind. Do you really want to lose this weight? That's one. Two, do you really want to keep it off? Because it's going to take some work. And it's going to take some discipline. And, and it may be a situation where you need a buddy, you know, until you get strong enough to do it on your own. You may need someone that's on that same journey as you to kind of help you along help you along with that challenge but as women you know we get busy we get crowded we don't get a chance to talk and check in with everyone and so even sometimes trying to check in with your journey buddy if you will is a little bit challenging so then what do you do you gotta you gotta muster up the strength to have that um that discipline so that you're not you're mindful of what you're taking in and how much you're taking in um and then so what, one of the ways that helps with that is the fasting because you, it's intentional, right? If you're fasting, it's intentional because you're like, okay, I'm not going to eat for 12 hours. So you're going to eat whatever you're going to eat before you start that fast. You're going to have a set time. You're like, okay, this is my last meal until that 12th hour comes around, right? Same thing if you say maybe you start off with six. You know, maybe you start off, um, you skip breakfast, you know, maybe you go into, or you just decide, okay, I'm going to skip lunch, or I'm just going to do breakfast and dinner. You know, you, you kind of stagger it and see what works for you, but have a goal in mind. Where do you want to go? Do you want to be able to fast for a full 24 hours? Do you want to be able to do it for that? Just start off with that 12 hours. Do you want to do, um, get to a point where you can do 48 hours, maybe three days? You know, you work your way up and see, you know, because you're going to, you're going to have some experiences. You're going to get hungry. You're going to be thirsty. You know, I would say, I would, I would be, I would recommend still drinking water, stay hydrated, you know, um, as far as the fasting, you know, um, mm, tea maybe. Um, but as far as the food, being able to, to cut that out for that, for that amount of time that you decide to set. Raza? I think you answered the question when you say, um, because some, you know, differ on how they fast. Mm -hmm. So what you just said, I want you to repeat that. During that fasting time, because mm -hmm. I usually do, you know, the um, the 12-hour window. I'm sorry, 16-hour window. Mm -hmm. During that time, say that again, maybe tea, but not... what. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, not food. I said tea, maybe, maybe tea and then water. Stay hydrated. Okay. No um, coffee, no sugar, none of that, right? Yeah, may, maybe cut out the coffee. Maybe cut out the coffee. Now, me, I've been doing it for a while. So for me, I may say I may go coffee and I may just do all liquids. I may do coffee, I may do tea, I may do water, but just nothing solid. So that may work for you as well, too. But and coffee, be mindful, coffee can be dehydrating. So if you're not going to be drinking enough water, Maybe stay away from the coffee or the caffeine altogether. Thank you. And also, also too, um, I don't want to be wrong on this, but this type of fasting can be do, done daily, correct? Yeah, yeah. Especially if you're kind of doing like the intermittent fasting, you know, because I have a tendency to not eat until about one or two o'clock in the afternoon. And your body is doing its most, you know, that repair overnight, and then it's like detoxing in those morning hours. So if you cannot eat in the morning and wait to the afternoon, 
and just be drinking water and giving your body time to, you know, flush out and detox, it, it's a great benefit to your body. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. And so I know I, I mentioned um, there's some um, things on the slide here about the benefits. It said what people think it does and what it also does. So it has weight loss mentioned here and uh, reduces blood pressure, reduces blood sugar and insulin. Um, it's an antioxidant defense, lowers inflammation, recycles um, NAD. I should look that up. I'm not sure what that is. Cell cleanup, cleans out your cells, supports immunity. It helps to rebuild your immune, your immune system when you're fasting. Because when you're fasting, guess what you're also doing? Detoxing. Fasting is a way of detoxing. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit as well. Um, elevates fat burning. Okay, so you're not taking an extra food and calories. Guess what? You're allowing your body to, to burn up the fat stores that you already have in there. And that's a great thing because that's going to also help you to lose weight, right? Because it's not saying, okay, I'm just going to munch off of what you just put in there. Now I got to tap into what you got reserved, right? Um, neuroprotection, stress resilience, um, and it just helps you to not rely on food for everything. Because sometimes we can get in a space where we're depressed, you know, we're stressed out, we're going through things, and what do we do? We want to eat something, right? May not even be hungry. But if you get yourself in the discipline of fasting, Guess what? Even when you get into those stressful spaces, you can maybe remind yourself to pray, you know, or you're, you're focused on other things because you're, you're fasting. You're not going to just go to food because you already have a mindset of like, okay, no, I'm in my fasting period. So even though I really want to grab that biscuit, you know, I'm not going to grab the biscuit. I'm going to leave the biscuit alone, right? So that's what we want to do. We want to get ourselves in the... Um, and that discipline. So it'll help. And so that'll help you in mental and emotional, you know, because if you can learn to be okay with not eating, guess what? You can eliminate that hangriness. You know that word hangry when you're hungry and you're hang and you're angry at the same time because you're so hungry, you ain't you haven't eaten anything and now you got attitude. Well, if you get yourself in a in a habit of fasting, you're already used to kind of being a little bit hungry because you don't. You're not stuffing yourself and getting full all the time. So then that, that could help with your mental and emotional too. You know, probably something that people don't really talk about, but, you know, goes a long way with that. Um, next up, fasting. Fruits cleanse. Vegetables are detoxing. Herbs heal. Fasting does all three. Cleanse, detox, heal. Heal your body from the inside out. It's amazing how just giving your body a break from food, how it can regenerate the processes in your body. Very powerful. All right, so on to some health and wellness tips. Benefits of supplementation. So I'm not gonna go, it's, it's, it's a lot of supplementation out there. A lot of herbs, a lot of minerals that are good for us, right? Um, that we probably typically don't talk about on a regular, but most especially for the purposes of this particular um, meeting, I did want to highlight selenium. Selenium is um, a highly recommended uh, supplement and essential mineral that is talked about most especially by holistic doctors, naturopathic doctors, those who believe in healing from a natural perspective instead of, you know, like chemical and pharmaceutical medications, right? Because when you think of food and you think of even fasting, you think about detoxing, um, part of the issue, well, big issue with our bodies is not having the minerals and vitamins that we need or having a lack of them, not having sufficient amounts. In today's society, which has been happening for well over, I don't know, 50 or 60 years or probably longer than that, you know, the food industry has changed so much. Even the soils have changed. And so where once upon a time you were getting minerals and those essential nutrients from the foods that you eat, nowadays things are so processed that you don't even get the essential nutrients and minerals that you need from your, that you need from your food. So you need to add them in. 
you need to either find and search out whole foods where they actually contain these things and search them out or you have to add them. Because guess what? If your body is lacking these minerals and these, these essential minerals and nutrients, you're going to end up with some nutrient deficiencies. And that's what's going to lead to sickness and illness and disease. So I noted here some benefits of selenium in particular. There's a doctor that I follow, um, got, a, got his book as well. I meant to include it here in the slideshow, but I could give you that, that offline. Selenium, which I highlighted at the top, is anti-cancer. It promotes cancer cell suicide, inhibits tumor blood vessels, detoxifies cancer-causing agents, reduces oxidative stress, stabilizes DNA. It can lower chances of prostate cancer, lower chances of breast cancer. But guess what? Nobody's talking about selenium. If selenium was talked about and highly recommend, and it's cheap too, you know, the cancer industry would lose a lot of money. It's a lot of money in, in taking care of cancer, chemotherapy, radiation, hospital visits, side effects of that. It's a lot of money in that, you know? So talking about prevention is not um, financially lucrative, if you will. And so we have to take control of our health. We have to find out what's most beneficial to us to try and maintain health, right? So taking this simple selenium supplement, look at all of these other benefits it has. It's anti-asthma, it's anti-arthritis, muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, look, due mainly to the antioxidant effects of selo enzymes. It improves fertility, it boosts immunity, it's anti-aging, uh, it helps with thyroid regulation, it improves brain function. Um, it's an antiviral. It's an anti-heart disease and anti-diabetes. I mean, it's amazing. And I just wanted to be, I'm, I'm so happy to be able to share this with you all um, and, and, and share with others, you know, dig it out, find you some selenium um, and start taking that on a regular, if you can, you know. I've been taking it for the past, let me see. I think I started it like last year, I want to say sometime last year. And it's, it's been extremely beneficial. So I wanted to share that one with you guys. Um, also, minerals. Wanted to jump on this one really quickly. R minerals, um, deficiency, symptoms. So as you can see highlighted in red are a number of symptoms and it lists next to it the minerals that you're probably deficient in, which is causing those issues. Cramps, calcium and sodium deficient. Depression, also calcium and sodium. Diabetes, chromium, vanadium, and zinc. Uh, I know you guys have heard of zinc. Zinc is talked about a lot. You take a combination of zinc and selenium, you're gonna really help improve your immune system as well. Um, goiters, iodine and copper. And these are those essential minerals and nutrients that our body needs. Um, as you can see, anemia, iron, and selenium, uh, arthritis, calcium, copper, magnesium, and some of these need to be taken together. What I recently found out um, is Himalayan salt, pink Himalayan salt. It, now, be careful because they're not all made the same. You need to find the ones that's on the package, and it talks about the number of minerals it has in there. So the ones I recently have brought has about maybe over 80 essential minerals, which includes a list, all of these and more. And so what I do is I take a little bit of that pink salt, I add it to my water because you, your body absorbs water better if you have minerals in it. So you add a little pinch of that pink salt because otherwise you stay thirsty, you keep drinking water, you're wondering why am I still thirsty? It's not hydrating you because your body's not absorbing the water. It's just going right in, getting on down in the kidneys and it's going right out. It's not absorbing the hydration, but you add a little bit of the, the minerals to it and it'll be better, right? Um, you can sprinkle that pink salt on your food. Not, and I'm not talking just about, you know, table salt, white bleach salt. No, 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 no. Himalayan pink salt that has 
the sourced minerals inside of them. That way you're, you're getting the actual minerals that you need for your body to help increase um, and uh, limit those deficiencies, right? Constipation, um, iron, magnesium, and potassium, chronic fatigue, zinc, selenium, chromium, cardiovascular disease. And some of these are, are repeat, they're coming up. Even look, hair loss, copper and zinc. You know, how often do we talk about taking the copper, making sure that we get enough copper in our diets? You know, and so we end up with all of these um, varieties of, of illness and, and symptoms. Brittle nails, iron and zinc, birth defects, zinc, copper, cobalt, selenium keeps coming up there. Look, cancer, selenium, geranium. Um, and if you guys need to get this information, I can definitely share with you um, later. Um, now, gray hair, I got a ton of gray hair, copper. Up. I don't know if that's a hereditary thing because I've been graying since I was in my 20s or if I've just been always deficient in copper. I don't know. But um, I wonder, I haven't taken it like specifically like as an individual supplement, but I wonder if I took it, would it stop graying my hair? I don't know. I don't mind the gray hair though, as long as it's healthy. Um, just a little sidebar. So let's move on to detoxing. Detoxing, benefits of detox. Weight loss, better digestion, reduce your cholesterol levels, relieve constipation, eliminate back pain, clearer skin. You know, acne comes from toxins in your body, right? That comes from a buildup of toxins. That's all, that's particularly what it is. And our foods have a lot of toxins in them. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit too. Um, treat eczema and psoriasis. Mental clarity. Talked about that emo emotional and mental health, you know, with fasting. And also fasting being a method of detox. Um, eliminate parasites. Treat candida overgrowth. Better concentration and focus. Reduce your blood sugar levels. You know, your doctor will tell you if you're going in for blood work um, to fast overnight. Don't eat anything after midnight. They're just telling you to fast. They're not telling you why and the benefits of it. You know, they just say, oh, well, we just got to have, you know, this, this, this. So when we do the blood work, you know, it doesn't show X, Y, and Z, right? Reduce inflammation, heal muscle pain, reduce arthritis. And what is arthritis? essentially inflammation, right, in your bones. You get better sleep, release negative thoughts, eliminate toxins and heavy metals. Again, a lot of what we eat has toxins in it and has heavy metals. And so, little picture on the side, support detoxification pathways naturally. So here are your pathways, your liver, huge detoxer in your body, your colon, your kidneys, you know, that filters out your blood, your skin. It's a huge detoxing mechanism. When you sweat, you want to sweat, work out, get some exercise in and let that sweat come out of there. So your lymph nodes and your lungs, respiratory, right? Read your nutrition facts and labels. Important, important, important. So we're talking about detoxing, we're talking about fasting, we talking about nutrition. Well, guess what? Where does all this stuff come from? Food. So what's in our food? Are we mindful of what's in our food? Our food isn't the way it once was. It's not natural and pure. So we end up with a lot of toxins in our bodies. And guess what? Those toxins that end up you know, building up in our bodies make it hard for us to lose weight because they're blocking up stuff. They're clogging up things. So things aren't working as efficiently as they need to. They're not flowing through, you know, the vessels and the arteries and the digestive tract and the respiratory. You know, you're building up mucus, you know, you're clogging up, you know, with too much fat in the, you know, from the foods that we're eating and all of these chemicals. So look at here. This is just a snippet. It's tons more than this. Preservatives, right? BHA, BHT. How do you even say this? butylated hydro -yanis. I can't even pronounce this. Where is it found? Chewing gum, breakfast cereals, breads, crackers, potato chips, 
nut mixes, and many others. So ask yourself, why do we need this stuff that we can't pronounce in our potato chips? And we love potato chips. I know I do. Nut mixes, right? Not, not supposed to be healthy for you. Well, how healthy are they for you if they got all these preservatives in, right? Chewing gum. We love chewing gum. I haven't chewed gum in a bit. I've, been, I've stopped chewing gum for a while because it does contain some stuff. I'm like, oh, no, I want to pull that. So I haven't really been chewing gum. I did find one kind of natural chewing gum that was made out of like, I don't know, tree sap or something. So I chew that every now and again, right? And so, and I've chewed gum all my life. Um, and look at the potential health risks, neurological problems, behavioral health issues, hormonal issues, metabolic dysfunction, and cancer. You know, just from that one preservative, TBHQ, it's in your instant noodles, probably your oodles and noodles, your crackers. We eat crackers. We think nothing of it. Oh, it's just crackers. Crackers are fine. No, they're not. They got all these preservatives in them. Candy, commercial pizza, and many others. Potential health for nausea and vomiting. Tinnitus, delirium, sense of suff suffocation, liver toxicity, reproductive mutations. It says so deadly that just five grams can kill you. Be careful. Just read those labels. Find out what they are. Research what they are. Sodium benzoate. I've seen that one a lot. It's in your soft drinks, your fruit juices, your salad dressings, pickles, and others. So just when you think you just you just go into the grocery store, you just get it, you filling up your cart, you're getting some groceries, you think you're just doing okay. Well, guess what you're eating? Chemicals, preservatives, right? All of that. It's not good for you. Hyperactivity, asthma, cirrhosis of the liver, Parkinson's disease, and cancer from sodium benzoate. Why is this in our foods? Why is this okay? Um, sodium nitrate and nitrate, nitrite and nitrate is in your processed meats, your deli meats, your bacon, your ham, your smoked fish, your hot dogs. I stopped eating hot dogs quite some time ago because I would get a headache from them. I'm like, something's not right. And potential health risks, colorectal, stomach, and pancreatic cancers. You see how all these preservatives that are in the foods can lead to high levels of toxicity in your body can lead to cancers, can lead to any other number of health risks and symptoms. Why are you not just feeling good? You're not feeling right. Because we're eating chemicals that our bodies were never designed to process. Remember how we talked about in the beginning, how, he, how God wonderfully created us? Well, he didn't wonderfully create us to eat these preservatives. He didn't. That wasn't the purpose, right? Um, now this one down here, I can't even pronounce. Azo dicarbon carbonate. And so I'm doing this, and it may sound a little funny, but think about it as you're reading those nutrition labels. Do you really want to be consuming on a regular basis things that you can't pronounce and you don't know what they are, and knowing that they have some harmful effects to your body? Right? Where is it found? Dough conditioner and commercial baked goods. It says it's a plastic chemical found in yoga mats and shoe rubber. A lot of these preservatives and chemicals that they put in our food are also in our cosmetics. They're in our toothpastes. They're in our lotions. They're in our makeups. So you think, okay, well, I'm going to just stop eating stuff that I don't see that on a label. Well, read your lotion label too. Read your, read, your, um, read your cosmetics labels. It's going to be some stuff in there that you can't pronounce. You know, um, it, it's, it's upsetting. Um, so I'm going to stop and, you know, take any questions or comments you guys have. And I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Rosalind, so much for giving me the opportunity to speak and, and to share some of this information. I think it's important and vital to our community. Um, and, I, and I want you all to be mindful of how you live, what you take into your mind, what you take into your bodies. Live well and be well. Thank you.
Great job. Great job. Okay. I'm going to get you to, I want to see your whole face. <laughs> oh, Go ahead. Uh -huh. stop, stop the share? Yes, yes. So they can see. I love, okay. I like the natural look. I wanted y'all to see her natural look. She always so pretty. Oh, I do God. have a few questions. First, the selenium. Okay, I know it comes in drops, but it also comes in other forms. Which do you suggest is the most potent, the, the most pure form, or does it matter? Honestly, I think anything that can come in a liquid form is probably more potent than something that's going to go into a pill. Got you. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Now, now, what about essential oils? Okay. And I say that because it's not just a fad. <laughs> I know some people think it's a fad, but it's not just a fad. It's something that's been around for a long time. And oftentimes people don't realize how beneficial essential oils can be. Now, can do you have any knowledge about that? You want to talk about that a little bit? Because I know I use them on a regular basis. But you want to do sure. you? Use mm -hmm. Sure. Funny enough, um, I've been using essential oils for, um, I want to say over twenty years. I've been using essential oils. I learned, I learned about them when I first started um, with my natural hair, um, trying to figure out that whole process and trying to find ways to moisturize it and all that kind of stuff. So I started doing research and I. I the lady that was doing my hair, she was making her own oils. And so I was like, oh, I can make my own oil because I was buying it from her. So I started researching oils that were beneficial for hair. And it evolved into, you know, making the oils that were good for the body as well. And then, of course, aromatherapy. Right. And then when I met my husband, I found out that he had been a massage therapist. So he was very familiar with um, aromatherapy and oils. He even had a book. So I was like, oh, I can use this book and look in here and see what oils work for this. And so we keep essential oils on a regular and I still make hair oil and body oil um, and use them in the shower too. You know, if you get stuffy, you get a little congested, right? Put you some uh, eucalyptus, essentially eucalyptus oil in that steamy shower. Wow. And then um, orange oil, essential orange oil is good for body aches and pains. If you have some aches or pains or you have some cramps, you can take some and mix it with a carrier oil, maybe an avocado oil or olive oil, something light. Shake it on in and mix it in, rub it on your belly or your knees if you have an arthritis. Most recently, I started using ginger, essential oil ginger. Um, ginger is, you know, is a, herb, is a root, right, that is anti-inflammatory, is an antiviral, um, and it helps with a number of um, health issues. But I was like, wow, you know what? If I get it in the oil, it'd probably be good for those pains too. So I got the essential ginger oil. I mixed that in with some orange, essential orange oil and with the carrier oil and maybe some other, maybe some peppermint, you know, et cetera. And cause I have, um, I have like a flat foot, flat feet. And so if I'm walking around too much and my shoe isn't in, in the best, you know, the best support, if it's not in the best support, I'll get um, my feet to start hurting. So I don't like to walk around a lot. I like to wear sneakers. I like to wear a supportive shoe. For this wedding, I have on flat shoes. I do not have on heels, right? So I've started putting on. I start. I'll be in a little bit. I started putting on um, using a, a small bottle with the ginger and the orange oil in there and mixing it with my carrier oil. And I rub that on my feet day and night and it helps with that pain. You know, I get up in the morning and I'm feeling much better, you know? So you have arthritis, you have other aches and pains, use that ginger. You know, incorporate the ginger root into your smoothies, into your juices, you know, it's really good. for. So yeah, I'm definitely full on with the essential oils. Lavender, lemongrass, <coughs> Um, a hair oil I make, I've got some birch in there, some burdock root, um, the lemongrass, the lavender, the rosemary, um, some amala oil. I think that's the Indian oil, um, some Jamaican castor oil. That's not essential oil, but, you know, just a blend of oils that I use in there that I've been using um, to make my own little potions and stuff. So, yes. <laughs> 
That's good. That's good. Yeah, I love essential oils. And I know some of my go-to are peppermint, lemongrass, tea tree. You mentioned eucalyptus, coconut oil. Like, like I said, the journey of my hair. That's how I started discovering things. Oil of oregano. And oh, I just, yeah, I haven't got that one yet. That's what I need. Anyway. Yeah, I have arthritis, you know, and I don't take any medication for anything. Okay. Mm-hmm. My go-to medication is if uh, I, I research different things as far as what I can do with the essential oils. And at my age, many of my family's uh, family members, hypertension runs. Mm-hmm. I have none of that. No chromobility is at all because I try to do different things with the things I put in my body, the essential oils, different things like that. I'm not playing doctor, you all. That's not what I'm saying. But I go to that first. And I'm not saying never go to a doctor. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. But it's some things we can do for ourselves instead Mm -hmm. of running to a doctor automatically. Some of these things we can put in place. So, you know, so beautiful, by the way. Say it again. Your hair is beautiful, by the way. Thank you. I love it. Beautiful yeah. journey. I never do it. I love it. Yeah. Okay, so that that is great. Uh, that information that you gave us, and and I, I I'm so glad that you hit on some of the beauty care products because many people they don't understand about the aluminum that's in deodorants and all those things that they put into these things. We think that it's good for us, mm-hmm. and it's causing problems. Yes. So even the kids. Say it again. I said, I'm glad you said that. The deodorant. Yeah. I recently stopped using deodorant. I had was getting some rashes under my arms, and then I switched over to some natural deodorants that didn't have aluminum in them, and I was still getting breakouts and irritated. And so I was like, "Well, now what I'm going to do?" So now, most recently. Um, I went into the vitamin shop looking for a particular brand of natural deodorant and they didn't have it. They were all out. And the lady there, she said, she's like, you know, I stopped using deodorant a long time ago. I just use apple cider vinegar and that helps, you know, eliminate the, the odor causing uh, bacteria, whatever. And I was like, you know what? I got some at home in the spray bottle. I'm going to do just that. So I've been using that. I have not gone back to deodorant and my skin is well, cleaned up. Do you just spray? Just pure? Do you dilute it or anything, or you just spray it? Yeah, it's, dilute, it's diluted with maybe it's probably some distilled water in there. Yeah, in a little spray oh. bottle. Yeah, but just spray it up on there, smush it in like that. It'd be all, <laughs> it's gonna be a little wet and juicy for a little bit, but it'll evaporate after a while. Yeah. Oh. I gotta try that. I never heard exactly. that. Exactly. I hadn't heard that one either. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you want to go ahead and contribute, Miss Sydney, because I know you got some some jewels too on this subject. Well, I was listening to Kelly, and she did an excellent job. Um, and I, I, I fall into health and wellness too, so I I would encourage people. There's um, panels, you blood tests, you can go out and te- take that will tell what where your body is, because let's say Rosalind, what might work for her might not work for me, or it might not work for Kelly. So it's important to see where your body is lacking. And like she was talking about detoxing and everything, take all the sugar and flour and stuff out of your body and start adding it back in one by one. And you can tell what doesn't agree with your body. Yes. Because she gave a lot of good information and, you know, she's right on the clarity and how you feel when you take sugar and different things out of your body. And it's so important to go in the store and read those labels because a lot of things, words you don't know about, start looking them up and seeing what they mean and what you're actually, they're killing us. The U.S. government is making money off of the things we um we purchase. I heard her talking about hot dogs and how long she hasn't been eating hot dogs. Hot dogs are junk food. Now, every now and then I might, but it has been so long since I ate a hot dog, so it's not even funny. Yes. Yeah. You, know, you know what else I was going to say, too, uh, while you're talking about that? And you did a great job, too. I can't wait to talk to you offline about uh, what you provided as well, because uh, I got too many questions. I'm be long with it. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing, one one other benefit about the detoxing and the fasting that I also wanted to mention to you guys is that your body 
it's, it's, it becomes a, a signaling system for you. Like if I go back to eating something like the hot dogs, for example, I'm going to get a headache. If I eat anything that my body don't want, I'm going to get a headache. And I'm like, eh, okay, now I know I got to eliminate that. I can't go back to that. So your body is going to tell you, you just got to be aware of those things, especially, you know, after you, you coming off of that detox, maybe you did 12 hours, maybe you did a full day, maybe you did a couple of days of, um, you know, not eating any foods. And then you eat something that you shouldn't be eating. Your body's going to tell you right away, like, you know, no, that, don't, that don't feel good. It's going to let you know, like, it's going to push a button, like, no, that's a toxin. That's, we don't want that. or We don't need that. You know, so your body will tell you. But the only way it can really start telling you these things is when you, like you said, you pull away, you stop, you eliminate those things. You stop eating those sugars and those flours and all of those other things. And then when you start putting them back in, your body's going to say, that's okay. That's not okay. That's okay. That's not okay. Right? So it'll tell you because he's he's designed this wonderfully that's how he made him yeah yeah one other thing too even as far i'm not telling anyone to i don't i eat very little meat and when i say very little maybe mixed in something i mean very little i don't eat really eat meat i'm not a vegetarian but i'm a loose vegetarian i say it like that <laughs> but what i noticed when i stopped as far as fibroids i don't have any more problems with them at all because wow. of, I think it was the hormones and the, because I couldn't digest the, the meat anymore. It was something, you know, as I got a certain age, what I mean, immediately when I start, I started noticing a difference. My skin, if I get a bump, which is a rare thing, I'm like, okay, something is off. You then ate something. That's I'm, all. Yeah. I'm glad you said that too. Um, I didn't dig into that part, but yes, that's been a very heavy part of my journey is eliminating meat. Um, at one point, I was vegan for a, for a, a period of time, and in, ta in terms of weight loss, that weight melted right off like nobody's business. Okay, because my face was thin, my thin, my neck was thin, all of that, everything was I just was scrawny, you know. And people were looking like, "What's wrong with you? Like, stop eating meat," you know. It melts right off. Um, but like myself and many others, sometimes we kind of wean ourselves back on to certain meats and stuff. And then you can tell because, you know, your face start filling out a little more, you know, you'll pick it back up. But you can get yourself to a point where you're not eating meat like that on a regular basis, you know, and certain meats I won't eat at all. You know, I was I was telling people like I may eat oxtail sometimes I may eat some lamb chops sometime because those are just so delicious. But even after, but I don't eat meat every day. I don't eat on a regular basis, uh, especially those processed meats. But most recently, I went to make some lamb chops like last month for hubby. Um, he loves those. It's his birthday. And oh my goodness, it smelled so horrible. Just taking it out of the package. You know, wow. because they put all of those preservatives and chemicals in there to preserve it, to keep it looking red. So that, you know, when you buy it, it don't look like it's, you know, rotten meat, right? Yeah, which essentially it is because how long has it has it been off of that animal sitting up in the sitting up on that shelf so they got to preserve it so when we consume that meat we consume that whatever they put in it to the antibiotics you know all of that stuff and so that's another reason why it becomes harder and harder to digest this food because it's not just food they're not just animals out there grazing on the grass and and, and eating healthy grass and then now that's all they're processing. No, these poor animals are being farm raised with a lot of different chemicals packed in. Their conditions are sometimes deplorable. And so they're, they got to preserve it to keep it on the shelf. You know, it's the shelf life. Now, if you want to go to a butcher where well, you know they just got it right there and, and, you, and you do want to eat meat, that probably is your best case, you know, scenario to do that. But they've been burning a lot of those down too. So sometimes it's even hard to find those. Um, but if you can, I, I would say... You know, I don't, I'm not anti-meat, but I'm not, you know, heavy on the pro-meat side either. Yeah. You know, even with fish, salmon, I love salmon. Most of the salmon these days is farm-raised. So they're at, they're giving them some feed that they shouldn't be eating. They're, they're pumping them with dyes to keep them with a pink color. And then you're eating that. It's changed the texture. So it's not even a fresh fish anymore. And I love salmon. So I'm like, no, I only want the wild-caught fish, right? Yeah. If I'm going to even eat well, one thing to be careful, if you have a piece of chicken, a chicken leg that looks like a turkey leg, those things like that, be careful. 
If you have a piece of a fish that's usually small and is huge, be leery of that stuff because that's not natural. That's mm -hmm. not a natural occurrence. And some people say, oh, they got big pieces of chicken. Yeah, I'm not, uh -uh. don't eat. <laughs> you may want to think. I'm glad you, you said that too, because chicken is probably the hardest thing to give up, you know, especially yeah. when you talk about not eating meat. And that was one of the main things that I gave up. I haven't eaten chicken since 2017. There was, there was, there, there was one incident last year when I was on a road trip and I needed some food and I ate some and I was like praying like, Lord, please don't let this do nothing to me, you know, but other than that, I, do, I don't eat chicken at all. And I think chicken is one of those things that will uh, give you a challenge when trying to lose weight. Because again, chicken, they pack them in these big old, how you don't run out of chicken wings? Why is it so much chicken? Where are all these chickens at? Okay, so there's a lot of chickens out there. Somehow they overproducing these chickens. They're pumping it. They're cutting off their poor beaks, burning them off. They're pumping them with steroids. They're making them fatter and plumper. They're not big fat chickens. They're little birds, right? And so we're eating this stuff, right? And ingesting whatever, whatever they put in that chicken. We eating that. We're not just eating the chicken. That, and chickens eat whatever too. They kind of pick off the ground. So remember, whatever they eat and digest, we got to go back and eat and digest. Including I would say if you're going to eat that stuff by the anti um, bacterial with no hormones on it. And, and you could tell the difference in the taste when you buy it like that. Mm hmm. Yeah. So it, it's so many layers to this thing. It and it, it can drive you crazy because you get you got to watch every little thing. You know? Yeah. And the yeah. healthier you eat, the less food you eat, too. Say, say it again. The healthier you eat, the less food you eat. Sugar helps you crave more food. It's like an addiction. Mm -hmm. Yep, it turns on those receptors in your brain. Like exactly. Oh, that. Yep. Yep. So I, I guess to sum it all up, family, what we're seeing is let's do our homework. Let's do our homework and educate ourselves about the wealth and the benefits of you know of doing some things that's possibly causing harm and also put things in place that if something does happen, we're being proactive because we're, we're, be, we're prepared instead of being reactive. Yeah. How about that? Okay. Yeah, proactive work were asked for food too, because I know a lot of people who do pre-planning and preparing food. And when you do that, you don't eat on all of a sudden and you're less likely to eat foods that aren't good for you. So that pre-planning your meals yep. is powerful. Meal prep. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. All right, ladies, any final thoughts? You all did a great job. I thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you, Rosalind, as always. <laughs> you're welcome. All right, we'll be talking again. Y'all know, y'all know how I do. Once I get you one time, I'm going to call you back and mention it or something. I don't know what. <laughs> y'all make it a good one. Y'all stay right there. Come back right back in.